the field of uh, Alzheimer's moving fast, and um, the material I will present to you was presented a week ago in Budapest and will be presented in two weeks in Beijing. The whole world is uh, watching us in Canada because um, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, Dalhousie, Halifax, it's the hubs. So I thought I would focus on what's new in diagnosis. Uh, I know you're a sophisticated group of people, and um, what you'd like to know is what's like coming. Um, be careful what you wish for. You're like 50 year old, you want to know if you have Alzheimer. Um, you may not want to know that unless we have a treatment that will modify the risk. So we'll talk a bit about m risk modification. I'm hopeful that uh, within three years in Canada, we'll be able to do a risk assessment for your risk of getting Alzheimer in 20 years, the way we do now for risk assessment for heart attack and stroke, and modify the risk with lifestyle changes. And if you're a high risk person, maybe you'll take a pill. Uh, treatments, it's uh, hard work. Uh, we have our old drugs for 10 years, but the new ones are harder to come by, but I'll give you an update. And there may be exciting news in the biggest Congress of the year, which will be in Toronto in July. The big one this year is in Canada with results of new studies. It's not just about drugs, it's also about cognitive training, modification of lifestyles. There are studies to prove that they actually change things. So I'll give you a bit of news about that. And what's coming next? Lots of things, and a lot of things are happening in Canada thanks to the federal government support for a consortium that bridges all the Canadian researchers, not just in biology, but also in ethics. In the old days, that's like 10 years ago, to say someone had Alzheimer, you had to have dementia. And then you say, what's the cause of dementia? That's changed now. So if you look at these sequence of uh, symptoms over time, that's the classic uh, evolution of Alzheimer's disease where you have a bit of uh, anxiety, um, social withdrawal, mild depression, not very specific, but that mood phase um, is often there. If you think back, well, if you, your grandmother had Alzheimer, oh yeah, there was a few years she was kind of more quiet and socially withdrawn, and that's called a prodrome. It could be three to five years. And then you have the classic memory decline, forgetting where your car is, where your purse is, and you blame, of course, the husband. And uh, the guys who forget where their hammers are, <laughs> blame the wife, uh, and so on. It's something you're familiar with. And then you may compensate for these memory lapses for a while. It does not interfere with daily life in a significant way. But when it does, that's dementia. And then uh, you say it's at Alzheimer or stroke or both or Parkinson and other rare things. And then uh, over time, three years, five years, there's a phase of a more um, difficult behaviors, something you're all familiar with as health professionals or, or carers, uh, not recognizing uh, who you are and where you, who you, where we are and so on. And it gets better with time. Most of these troublesome behaviors improve with time. That's a practical message for the people in the room. Uh, if you deal with very, Difficult behaviors like aggressivity, especially at time of uh, self-care, it will get better with time. And if you need medications to control these behaviors, always reassess, you still need them periodically. And then there's a last stage of Parkinson-like changes where you cannot walk safely and you have muscle rigidity and you have difficulty swallowing and you get an aspiration pneumonia, one, two, three, and then you die. So the usual course of uh, dementia due to Alzheimer is eight years on average. It seems to be a bit longer now because of the care we provide. I don't think the medications made that much of a difference. It's more just the care overall, the information we give the families and the staff. And it's not been documented well yet, but I think people live an extra year in Canada with Alzheimer's now. Would you agree, those of you with experience? Yeah. The, the thing is we don't want the last stage to be extended by one year. We'd rather want the mild stage to extend by one year. And that's the general strategy for treatment. If you have only mild cognitive impairment, you're just forgetful, no dementia. I would like to stretch the body another three years before you get dementia. That's doable, probably. And if you have mild dementia, if we could delay progression to more severe stage, like the behavior symptom stage, if we could stretch the body, that by two years, yeah, that's, that's worth it. So from this, let's move now to the new stuff. So the dementia stage we're all familiar with. What is less familiar is the mild cognitive impairment stage. That's when you're forgetful. And in a way, we all are at times, isn't it? 
But we still compensate. We have post-its, <laughs> don't we? <laughs> Agendas, yeah. So as long as you compensate, you don't have dementia. Do you feel better now? Okay. <laughs> Also, you can be forgetful for many other reasons. So that's why you, if you go see your doctor, he or she will find out maybe you're B12 deficient, maybe you have sleep apnea. You'd be surprised how common that is, especially your boyfriends, if they jerk at night and they dream funny. Yeah, get them a sleep study. Um, the thing is, it's now called prodromal AD. It's a new name. MCI kind of out of the fashion now. We call it prodromal AD. It's kind of scary. But to prove that your symptoms are due to Alzheimer, you need special tests. So we'll go over them together. And then there's the no symptom phase of Alzheimer, where you have the pathology in your brain, and you may or may not progress to symptoms, depending if you die too soon, or there may be protective factors. But that's also now a field of study. So 50-year-old people who have family history of Alzheimer, like your mother, father, older brother, older sister, had Alzheimer around age 75, not 95, yeah, you may be more at risk, and then there's uh, studies for that. If your mother had Alzheimer at 55, that's a whole different story. So usually it's familial, it's uh, dominantly inherited. It, we have also programs for the young families. So the underlying pathology, that hasn't changed since two years. So before symptoms, there's already a bit of um, atrophy of the brain. You can see that with the MRI. Before that, there was a phase of the tangles within the nerve cells appearing. It's also called neurofibrillary tangles. It's all caused by a change in the sort of skeletal structure of your neurons. The tau protein is kinky. It's changed chemically. It happens to all of us with age. So over age 65, I'm there now. Yeah, I, I know I can tell in my uh, temporal lobe. Uh, it takes longer to learn German than I expected. Because <laughs> I have three grandchildren in Germany now. Um, that's normal. I'll show you an example of what the tau pathology looks like with a scan. It's quite spectacular. But it could stay there in your memory part, and that's all you have as you get older. So that's, you'll repeat your stories, you know, the usual grandpa thing. <laughs> um, before that stage of tau pathology, or concurrently, we're not sure there's an inflammation stage. That's pretty unique to humans. Start, start to see that in mice and rats. This inflammation stage may explain why if you take NSAIDs, medications for arthritis, before you get Alzheimer's, you reduce the risk of Alzheimer by 40%. This is a discovery made in, Tor in Vancouver by Dr. McGear about uh, 15 years ago now. But don't start taking these pills just on your own because there's 10% risk of uh, GI bleed, eh? Yeah. <laughs> but we're still testing this as an option for treatment, for prevention, because it's a very powerful hypothesis. Thank you, Dr. McGear. Because if you suppress that silent inflammation stage of Alzheimer, before you have any symptoms. You could modify the risk a lot. And then before that, there was the amyloid buildup. Amyloid is a protein in your brain. It does, I'm not quite sure what, um, physiologically. It may be, help fight infections. But in persons with Alzheimer, this amyloid protein is not metabolized the usual way. It's sort of spliced in an unusual way. And this beta 42 fragment, it just it builds up in your brain, can't get it out. That's why it's actually low in spinal fluid. It's stuck in your brain. And we can visualize this now with scans. I'll show you examples of that. 20 years before you get any symptoms. Ha. Huh. So the good news is you got 20 years to do something about it, if it's important enough. But you should know that over 65, one in three person has this amyloid buildup and they have no symptoms. Ah, so you have a protective factors at play and we have to work on that. So you can visualize now these different um, changes of pathology with different tools. There's two groups. One is the more amyloid-specific pathophysiology markers. So the amyloid you can see with a PET scan or measured through spinal fluid examination. And the neurodegeneration markers, that's the brain shrinking, that's the protein tau elevation, changes in the metabolism with glucose PET scan. So I'll show you some examples. Just to put this in perspective, these various changes, they don't occur all at the same time. 
And uh, we use this kind of uh, diagram now in research. Uh, where you have at the dem dementia stage, everything is abnormal. You don't need these tests to prove it, unless it's a very atypical case, very young person, no family history. But in the forgetfulness stage, what used to be called MCI, now called prodromal ED, yeah, th these scans, these blood, these spinal fluid exams do change over time, and they're used clinically for occasional patients, but they're used for research because it may be that a new treatment will modify the buildup of amyloid or the changes in tau protein, or the brain will not shrink as much as it should. And that's the first step to prove the drug is actually doing something useful. And then you could continue the study longer, hoping that the symptoms now will stop or not progress as fast as you expect them. In the pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic stage, the blue and green lines, this is the amyloid markers. Um, there are some studies underway now where you get the scan. We don't tell you the result because uh, it won't be useful to you. It will just worry you. <laughs> it's like having genetic tests for ApoE4. ApoE is the gene that we can measure easily. It's $16 test. We just do a cheek swab like CSI. And then we can see if you have one or two sides of the family, this weak gene, E4. And if you have two copies, uh, you're more at risk than just having one copy. 15% of people in this room, including me, have one copy. 15%. And we have no symptoms. And our lifestyle is modifying the risk. That's already established. If you have two copies, eh, maybe you should sign up for a study. Because <laughs> there's a special, special program for these people who are double four. Um, this is the gene that's most commonly known. It was actually a Canadian discovery by Jude Poirier. And if you ask, or you are asked by someone, can I have a genetic test for Alzheimer? That's the one, APOE, apolipoprotein E. And all of us here, we're 3-3. Three, three. Some of us are 3-4. We can live with that. If you're double four, that's 3% of the population. Eh, you're slightly more at risk. Why don't you want to be tested? First, you'll worry the rest of your life. Yeah, and all your children, your legal children, will have one copy, and maybe they don't want to know that, right? So let's uh, show some examples of what the tests look like. The red here is the um, amyloid buildup in uh, young people. These are people in their 50s. Um, the one on the right has already dementia. She's or he's probably 55 or thereabout. The one in the middle could be younger brother or sister, same family. You see the red, uh, it's just starting to show up in the basal ganglia. And the one on the left could be another brother or sister with no gene causing Alzheimer, so he or she's okay. So we have a study specifically for them. Vancouver is part of that program. Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal. Since uh, we met la, la two years ago, we have that program running. Uh, so we're looking for families where Alzheimer starts before 55 or thereabout with a dominantly inherited pattern. So this means at least one uh, affected relative, first, first degree relative, not your mother-in-law, okay? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I tell you, eh? and uh, before age 60, practically speaking. And the rule of thumb is if you, if you need two generations affected to say this is, looks like dominantly inherited, and then you have experts in, here in Vancouver, Dessa Sedovnik and her team to sort it out. And then if you want, you can get genetic testing. Then you decide, do I want to know the results or not? If you don't want to know, you're still eligible for a prevention study. So if you're in the middle, just early changes in the brain, no symptoms, yes, we want you. And we have medicines that will be offered to you uh, in a randomized, so you don't know what you're getting, and the doctor giving you won't know either, so we won't be biased. And uh, it's a two-year program. We're halfway through. Now we're starting the year one visit in Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, and uh, we'll have new drugs to try next January for these families. So message, you got it? If you have people in their 50s and it looks like it's familial, send them to Dr. Robin Seung at UBC or uh, Dessa Sadovnik at UBC and they'll be uh, brought into the fold. This is um, an example of what they did in Australia in an observation study where you scan people every year, people who are worried well like us, <laughs> mild symptoms or mild dementia. And uh, it just shows with the red, the red left side 
curve, the, um, the buildup of amyloid, it takes 20 years to reach the amount where you usually find in Alzheimer patients. Again, one third of people over 65 already have that amyloid top dose in their brain, but they have no symptoms. We don't know if they will ever have symptoms. Some of them will just because they're getting older, but not all of them. So there are protective factors we still have to understand, okay? This is new. Uh, this is the tau protein buildup. The anatomists, the pathologists, uh, had told us uh, 20 years ago that there was this normal buildup of tau changes in your brain. Um, what you see in the middle there, in the memory part of the brain, the temporal lobe, there's a, this tau buildup with age, which may explain why it's a bit, as I said, harder to learn the third language and to uh, repeat ourselves and so on. But when it spreads, spread is an important word here, to other parts of the brain, then it could be a cause of dementia. Spreading is now a popular word. Uh, it's uh, even prion-like, you know, like a mad cow disease. There's a virus-like particle that spreads cell to cell. So the tau protein abnormal, tau protein seems also to spread from cell to cell. So you will read about that, spreading of prion-like spreading. It doesn't mean it's, a con, it's an infectious process. It's not a contagious disease. I hope it's clear, because in England, they made a big mess about that. They said, Alzheimer's is like mad cow disease. Oh, come on, people. <laughs> now, the new thing is we can actually see the tau protein. Ooh. So you see the yellow? This just came out like four, four months ago. It's the first time in humans we can actually visualize the tau protein. So you get an injection of a radioactive tau. You glow in the dark for an hour. And uh, you see on the left a bit of the yellow. It's just subtle. The middle, you see a little more. And then people with dementia on the, on, on the right side. So you see the spread, the anatomical spread? Yeah. Now, can you have this tau abnormal change in your brain and no symptoms? Absolutely. Ah. So there are protective factors. And what can tip the balance? Something you know already, small strokes. So if you have someone who's 90, the amyloid buildup, the tau spread, they may have zero symptoms. And if they do, it's usually because they have small strokes. That may be silent that you see only on the scan. That's been shown clearly in the nun study, study with the nuns who gave their brain to God, meaning the doctor. And <laughs> seriously, and uh, those nuns were examined uh, every year, uh, getting scans and neuropsych tests. And then when they died, uh, they could clearly show that uh, it's not sufficient to get, have amyloid and tau to get dementia. What was the difference is small strokes. And small strokes is what you can prevent. So men in this room, blood pressure. You, there's another thing you can do, also men in the room, is you have a girlfriend or a wife. You, you remember me saying that two years ago? It's still true, okay? So uh, social networking is another polite way to say it. Women are very good at that, men not as good. So the CSF changes. So the scans are nice, but they're expensive. It's about $3,000 a scan. Spinal fluid examination, that's $1,000. So it's cheaper by comparison. And I suspect that if we have a new drug approved in Canada in a year or two that will prevent the amyloid buildup or reverse it, you're going to need a spinal tap before you get the drug to show that you actually need it. OK? So spinal taps, not fun. But if it's done by a doctor who's used to it, it's no big deal. And uh, what you're looking for is the uh, amyloid protein. It's stuck in the brain, so there's less of it in the spinal fluid, so low levels. And tau is up because it's leaking out of damaged neurons. And if you do a ratio of the two, you get a score. And that's quite reliable, even for individual patients. And in rare cases, you may have a, that kind of exam done now in BC. Uh, the spinal fluid would be shipped to Athena Diagnostics or some other lab in the U.S. because we don't have now we don't have one yet available in Canada for clinical purpose, and it's a thousand dollar. But it's well worth it if you're 60 year old, you're a lawyer, you're a doctor, you're a nurse, social worker, and you're worried that you're having symptoms. Your mother had it, your brother had it, whatever, and you want to have an early diagnosis. So in special cases, we'll do the tests that are normally used only in research. Okay. 
And the final test I have to tell you about, uh, it is available uh, in all the provinces in Quebec, but not reimbursed, unfortunately, as readily. Uh, it's a glucose scan, just go, good old-fashioned PET glucose scan. It's done in cancer, looking for uh, hot spots, metastasis. If you do it for the brain, as you see here uh, at the bottom right, bottom right, it's someone who has less glucose being used in the back part of the brain, hypometabolism, which reflects loss of synapses, actually, not loss of neurons so much. And it's a change you see in early Alzheimer, even with minimal symptoms. And the top picture uh, with the arrow, that's the cingulum. So if you slice the brain this way, this uh, part of the brain where, where a lot of con fibers converge, it's like the, what do you call it, like a cable. <laughs> Uh, of the brain, it's really uh, low in terms of metabolism, even with mild symptoms. And uh, if, again, if you're 60 year old and you have symptoms and you're worried and it could affect your work, you don't want to take a chance to make a professional mistake, that's the scan you should get. That's available right now across Canada. Okay, just to wrap this up for diagnosis, um, there's um, meetings. Uh, and publications about uh, how to define uh, which test is most useful if you have to pick one or two. This is periodically revised. The last revision was just a month ago. I'll give you the reference at the end. Um, the concern is, is it affordable? So let's say all the 60-year-old in this room now, to want, they want a checkup. They all want a PET scan. Which one? Huh? And, oh, you want a spinal tap? Okay, <laughs> I doubt it, but <laughs> you see what I mean? It could easily um, um, fill the memory clinics with worried well, and then we don't have enough time for people with dementia. So who's going to do the assessment? That's an ethical issue, isn't it? And also who's going to pay for the test? If you're just worried well, low risk, it's a waste of resources. Fortunately, we have observation studies going on in uh, the United States, Canada, and Australia, I already mentioned, and a new one called CCNA, Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging. And we are starting this summer to look for healthy people over age 60. I'm sure I'll find lots of healthy people in this room to volunteer. This is an MRI of the brain and a spinal tap. And you get a free exam with me or somebody like me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's only one time to start. There'll be also a geriatric kind of assessment. How fast can you walk between chairs, you know, the Berg scale, and can you hear me hearing tests? So it's more of a comprehensive geriatric style uh, package and more specific things related to dementia. And hopefully we'll repeat that every three years and get a feel for natural history. But what's different is you also sign up that you're available and willing if there's a study that is specifically for you. So let's say you're 65. Well, come on, nobody's 65 here. Okay, I'm 65, and um, my risk is uh, so much because of family history. Uh, I gave blood in that test. I had a scan in, in, in that study. And uh, in a year time, somebody comes um, from States or France, and they say, we have something to try for those people who have exactly those characteristics. They're just uh, mildly forgetful. They're APOE4-1 copy and uh, they have amyloid already in their brain. We need 200 of those. So we punch some numbers, we pull out 200 people from our data bank, it ticks. And then we have to ask individually, do you still want to sign up for this? But it will speed up things. You know, we can find the 200 in a month instead of two years, which is the current issue. So this is what the, all the tests look like if you put them together. You have the A-beta pathophysiology markers on one side, and you have the neural, neural injury markers on the other side. And if you have a boat, well, lucky for you, <laughs> you, you probably have the Alzheimer pathology or mild cognitive impairment or dementia. If you have neither one, you probably don't have Alzheimer, right? And that could change the treatment. Um, yeah, so interest in asymptomatic people, and we will not tell you the results because you don't want to worry about it the rest of your life. Uh, disclosure, so if you get scans done, um, especially the scans, because it's kind of obvious pictures, uh, there was a big issue in the States about that. Uh, if the patient really wants to know, or the subject really wants to know, uh, where do you draw the line? With the consent forms, it says we won't tell you, unless it's clinically relevant. The thing is, the clinical relevance may change quickly. Yeah. So we're on top of that.
And finally, uh, this is what the changes look in the biomarkers in people who are 50 year old. See the line in the middle, zero? That's the age of onset in the family. So let's say your mother had Alzheimer at 50, you're now 40. If you are in one of those observation studies, you already have amyloid buildup if you're a genetic mutation carrier. And you can sign up for a study to prevent this buildup to continue. Again, we'll have um, an, another group of drugs to test here in Vancouver starting in January. So uh, Robin Siong at UBC is the lead investigator in Vancouver for that project. So that was the diagnosis. Is that enough? Can we move on to treatment? Okay.